Hi, I'm David Grease, prof Professor Emeritus of Computer Science, having been in the Computer Science Department since 1969. I feel privileged to be able to interview John Hopcroft, who came to the CS Department two years earlier in 1967. John got his BS degree in Seattle University in 1961. That was a year after I got mine. His PhD from electrical engineering at Stanford just three years later in 1964. So I lost three years to him. He spent three years as an assistant professor at, at Princeton, and then he came here to Cornell, and he's been here ever since. John has excelled in three major areas of, of pro what a professor does. First, his research has been outstanding. Uh, and he got the Turing Award, for, that's, a, that's the ACM Turing Award, that's the, the highest research prize you can get in computer science. There is, no bell, there is no Nobel Prize in computer science. So he has it for some of the work he did in those early days, in the early 70s, I think. Secondly, and he's continued that research, he's still doing it at the age of, I guess, in his 75, 75, 75. I'm 76, he turned 76 in two months, I think. Right. Uh, so that's research. Second, as you know, our computer science department has been instrumental in setting the tone for the field in what it teaches and how it does research, and that's partly because of some of the textbooks that he's written on formal languages, automata theory, and algorithms. Really top-rate books that set the tone in the 70s, and some of them are still being used. Third, John is the statesman of computer science. Not only was he chair of computer science, he was dean of engineering. He then has done tremendous work for the field itself. He was appointed by President Bush to the National Science Board. He served on the National Research Council Commission, one of them, on many advisory boards, including boards in Chile, in Vietnam, and the kinds of education they do, India, China, where he's been spending a lot of time. So he is a statesman who has really spoken out for the field, not only for uh, research, but to help education throughout. So in all three th of those areas, he's excelled. So that's it. Did I embarrass you enough? <laughs> no, but, but I, I was actually very fortunate uh, when I grew up because I was in a very stable family. Uh, I never heard either my mother or father say anything negative about either one. And ne neither of them had actually finished high school. Mm -hmm. And they knew that an education was important. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to have a better life than they had. And so probably when I was in elementary school, I knew I had to go to college. <laughs> uh, and they did everything so that I would have a, a more successful life. Um, also, the teachers that I had when I was young, um, I, I went to a, a Catholic uh, elementary school. And it turns out that the teachers there had not gone to college. I didn't know this. But when they finished high school, they wanted careers in helping other people learn. And uh, having teachers who really care about the success of their students just has a tremendous impact. And when I was in high school, uh, it turns out the algebra teacher was the football coach. But somehow he conveyed to me and to other students that he'd be disappointed if we didn't learn. And that really focused me. I didn't want to disappoint him. So uh, just the, the teachers that I had had such an impact on my life. I wanted to have the same impact mm -hmm. on others. And uh, I went on then to Seattle University. I got a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, when I was a senior, I went over to the University of Washington to just inquire about doing a PhD there. And they, they told me that it was unfortunate they couldn't admit me because I had gone to an unaccredited undergraduate <laughs> institution. 
-hmm. I, I went back and talked to my department chair, and he says, why are you applying to the University of Washington? Apply to Stanford. <laughs> well, I would never you know, have thought of, of going to Stanford, but Stanford was happy to take me with my NSF fellowship, and it, it had a, a big impact on my life. But I was still, I was gonna go back uh, to Seattle, uh, never thought of going somewhere else. Uh, but I happened to be, when I was walking past my advisor's door. This is at Stanford? This was at Stanford. Before you, get, okay. before yes. you move on, let's talk about Stanford a little bit. Yes. Did they do any computing at that time? Uh, there was computing there. Uh, but you've got to remember that this was in the early, early days. 60, 61 to 64 you were there. Three yes. Years. So uh, 7090 was a powerful computer, I think, in those yes. days. Uh, I, I had started earlier uh, when I was an undergraduate. I had an opportunity to program for a faculty member in the physics department. Uh, in this, Fortran? Uh, no, this was before Fortran. Assembly was, language. This was assembly language because Fortran, if it had been invented, it hadn't gotten to Seattle yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I did a lot of, of, actually it was machine language programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was the machine? Uh, it was a, the 650. Six, it, 650. Had a, it had a rotating drum. Yes. And you had to decide what memory location you were going to use as to where the yes. head of the drum yes. was. Uh, things have changed yes. Yes. Since, since those I days. I remember Knuth wrote a paper on how to optimize your program for that. Right. Uh, there, there, yes. there, was, there was actually a piece of code yes. that would, would optimize your program and you could use that. So at, at electrical engineering, did your thesis have anything to do with computing? Uh, my, th my thesis was on, on threshold logic. A um, little, little bit to do with computing, but not that mm -hmm. much. But at that time, remember, there were no computer science yes. departments. Yes. And um, so, uh, well, the, the story of how I got to Princeton is I was walking past my advisor's door, and he said, come in. And he said, Ed McCluskey is on the phone, and he wants uh -huh. to hire somebody. And he handed me the phone. <laughs> And I, I talked to Ed a little, and Ed invited me back to Princeton for a job interview. And um, they made me an offer, and so I decided I it would be interesting to go back to uh, be at an Ivy League institution for mm -hmm. a few years to see what it was like. Did Ed stay at Princeton? Did uh, he move back to uh, Stanford? Af after a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there for three years, but he, he got frustrated mm -hmm. sort of as I did. I see. Um, there was a, a, a faculty member in an area, uh, communications theory. And this was an established area. And whenever there was a faculty opening, he could find five candidates who were outstanding mm -hmm. because every university had a department and nobody was hiring anymore in that area. But McCluskey, when he tried to find a computer scientist, there was no university producing any and universities were starting to think they better hire, and so he could only get average people. Mm -hmm. And um, th there was a fight. They didn't realize that maybe they ought to hire anybody they could get and, and start to build, and uh, both of us got, fr got frustrated. Mm -hmm. So uh, you went to to, to Princeton, and you continued your EC, your electrical engineering work? No, the, the fortunate thing for me is Ed asked me to teach a computer science course. Uh, he understood that computer science was gonna be important. And I had to ask him, what does one teach in a computer <laughs> science course? Because there, there were no books. Uh, and he gave me four papers, and he said, if you teach what's in these four papers, it'll be a good course. Mm -hmm. And and that was uh, the first course. And what were the papers? Basically, there what uh, were they about? They were about uh, uh, Rabin and Scott's paper on finite automata, mm -hmm. a paper on regular expressions, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not quite sure yeah. what the other two were. Yeah. Uh, but this was actually I taught a course in automata theory, formal languages, mm -hmm. and then I For asked graduate students. Uh, this or was or graduate not? students. Yeah. There there were six graduate mm -hmm. students in the course. Uh, one of them is Jeff Allman, who is now a faculty member yes. at Princeton, and one Thank was you. Al Aho, who is a faculty member at Columbia. Um, it, it was a very powerful set of yeah. graduate students. In fact, they were probably- You wrote books with them. Well, I asked Allman if he wanted to write a book mm -hmm. with me, and, and we wrote the book, mm -hmm. and 
that pretty much yeah. structured how uh, Tamil theory, mm -hmm. formal languages, was taught in the early years. Uh, but one, one of the things I should mention is the fact that Ed had me teach that course made me one of the world's first computer scientists. Mm -hmm. And there is an advantage of being in a new area. Uh, you could imagine, well, one of the reasons why did President Bush appoint me to the National Science mm -hmm. Board when I was only in my 40s? Well, he was looking for a senior computer scientist, mm -hmm. and there weren't any that were older. <laughs> you could imagine if I was in high energy particle physics, I would still be waiting today for the mm -hmm. senior faculty ahead of me to retire so I could have that kind of opportunity. I, th I think we're all fortunate in being in on the ground floor of this field. Right. And that's what I try to tell students today. Uh, I, I think computer science is changing. It's becoming an outward looking discipline. And they ought to position themselves for the f future of computer science, not the past. Yes. And, and in fact, you know, a time of change, the world is changing. And this is an opportunity for people. Those individuals and organizations and countries who position themselves for the future are simply going to have yeah. uh, fantastic opportunities. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. wait with that topic. We can get to that nearer right. the end and talk more about your Princeton experience, what you didn't like uh, as much as you want to, and then how you got to come to Cornell. Yeah, uh, there was just so much politics at Princeton. Uh, that, uh, well, maybe I should say one thing. I was asked to run the seminar series, and I was given a budget. And the people who had ran it before didn't invite any outside speaker. They used just the budget to, for dinner. So what I did is I changed it and said, I've got enough money to invite two people, if I invite them only from the East Coast. <laughs> and uh, I invited Fred Henney from um, uh, MIT and Yuris Hartmanis from Cornell. And then we had dinner at our house because we couldn't afford to, then to take them out. And when I just talked with Eurus, it just became clear to me that being at an institution where I would be valued based on merit rather than on politics, I, I would do much better. And Eurus, we happened to be talking, and uh, uh, so I just asked him, I said, well, if I came to Cornell, you know, what would you pay me? And he made me a very good offer, and I <laughs> said, you know, I'll accept it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it was just the notion that actually Cornell is not as highly ranked as Princeton. And, and I knew that the graduate students wouldn't be quite the same quality. Yeah. But the fact that Cornell would evaluate me on basis mm -hmm. of merit just outweighed. I, I'm not very good at yeah. politicking. And, uh, so that's why so I So I just saw a, a new ranking of world universities, and Cornell is number 10. Yes. I think Princeton is five or six or I, something I think like Princeton that. is up around yeah, five or yeah. six. There's not much difference. Not much, that. but it does make a yes. big difference in the quality yes. of PhDs. And they have more yes. of an endowment and are able to support yeah. more students that way. So yeah. um, Bob Constable got his undergraduate degree in mathematics at Princeton. Yeah. And he had a lot to do, his uh, Alonzo Church, Land yes. Calculus was his thesis advisor. Yes. At PS, senior thesis. Did you know him, or was that department so far from yours that it, you could get It to was separated him? because, uh, and by, by the way, in, in mathematics, they're really world class. Yes. There's no question yes. about yes. it. Uh, but Princeton started engineering, but it was off on the side of mm -hmm. campus. and. It wasn't, I don't think it wasn't really viewed as uh, mm -hmm. the same way that the key parts of Princeton were. Mm -hmm. And I had very little contact with the math department there. Mm -hmm. So, in 67, you came here to Cornell. Yes. And how was that in the beginning? What did you like about the department? Oh, uh, I, I liked it because, uh, first, first of all, Hartmanis, as you know, was chair. Yes. And, and he was supportive. He, he was supportive of development of faculty. Uh, if, if you wanted to do something and you went to him, he would find out uh, you know, a way to do it. Um, and uh, very early on, uh, I was running graduate admissions. And there was something I wanted to do. And I remember him telling me, uh, you know, John, don't ask for permission. If you may get your hand slapped later, but just go <laughs> ahead and do it. 
his his philosophy was do what is right, and mm -hmm. um, and you know if you make a mistake that it didn't bother him as long as the decision you had made made sense at the yeah. time with the information yeah. you had. Um, so it was just a very supportive mm -hmm. department. Yep. Well, that that's what everybody seems to feel about right. the department at that time. Right. Uh, so what kind of work were you doing then? I mean, you had been into formal languages and automata theory. When right. did you write the book with Ullman, and how did you get into algorithms? Oh, well, we wrote the book with, with, with Ullman uh, just still while I was at, at Princeton. I'd, mm -hmm. I had written it, and it was published the first year I was at Cornell. Uh, but I realized that this area was, was sort of coming to a close, that mm -hmm. uh, uh, computer science was more than, than the formal languages and things that I was doing. And so I asked if I could have a year's leave and go mm -hmm. to Stanford uh, and just refresh myself and get into the area of algorithms. And why did you choose Stanford? Stanford's department started at the same time as this one in 65. Well, Stanford mm -hmm. was highly rated and Don Knuth was there. I and he had written this, the first two volumes. Yes. And, uh, and it, it was probably the top mm -hmm. computer science department there. I'm trying to think of the name of the person who actually created Forsyth, I think. For George, George Forsyth, Forsyth yes. yeah, he had created it. And yes. Yeah. So I, I was there from 66 to 69, and then came here just as Don Knuth went there. there. Yes, we overlapped yeah. for a few months. Yeah. And, and who did you work with, and what happened there? Well, I ran into Tarjan, who was, who was a graduate student. And uh, at that time, uh, there was an algorithm for determining if a graph was planar, mm -hmm. which ran in n cube time. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to reduce it to n squared. Mm -hmm. uh, but I knew how to get it down to n log n. Mm -hmm. So I started to work with him to see if we could get it down to linear. And I, I showed him depth first search. Mm -hmm. And with depth first search, we were able to uh -huh. get it to be linear. And, but then, I mean, I realized that at that time, computer uh, individuals measured how good a computer program was by its actual running time mm -hmm. in seconds. And, and the difficulty with that is you didn't know if someone published an algorithm later whether the speed up was due to the faster computer, mm -hmm. uh, better programming, or whether he had tuned it to the, to that to the examples the first person uh -huh. had used. And if you pick some other examples, it might not have been as good. Mm -hmm. And I also realized as programs were getting, uh, as computers were getting faster, the size of programs was going to be larger. And what was really important was the growth time of the algorithm. And so I proposed that as a mm -hmm. way of measuring algorithms and developed a number of techniques for showing uh, how to construct optimal algorithms for that criterion. Mm -hmm. But this was a revolutionary idea, by the way. Most people I talked to thought it was stupid. <laughs> but you won out because oh, it yeah. was not stupid. No, and, and uh, Don Knuth is the one person when I mentioned it to him, he says, oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he just immediately understood, yeah. Did you talk to him often? Uh, not, not that often. He was very busy yes. working on volume, on volume three. Volume three, yes. Uh, I wrote my book on compiler construction, came out in 71. I looked ahead, his seventh book was going to be on compiler construction. And I said, when his book comes out, that's the end of mine. He has finished book four, I think, and the rest are still out in the future and will never be done. It, the field just got too big for him. We were saying earlier, the yeah. nice thing about the field at that point is that you knew everybody. Right. Not just in your area, but right. throughout. It was very nice. You could go to a technical conference in your area and you met 90% of the people in the yes, area. Yeah, but that's yeah. not true today. No, no. So you spent a year at Stanford? I, I spent 1970. 1970, yeah. yes. And uh, you worked mainly with Tarzan? Right, we, you, we shared an office. you started writing a book? Uh, no, I, I- Algorithms book? Well, I, I put the material together, but then I started to look for a co-author. Uh, mm -hmm. And I tried a couple people at MIT, but they weren't interested. And then I found uh, Aho and, and Allman. Uh -huh. and Again, your students from, right. from Princeton. 
that that's neat how that worked. And you came back. Oh yes. Oh, I had no intention of uh, of, 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 of leaving. Yes, yeah. No. Right. Too good a place. Right. Uh, was the 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 tenor of the department the same there? As far as I, when I was there. Mm -hmm. Uh, people were spread out too much. You didn't meet all the people. They still certainly didn't go to lunch together. You know, the tenure of the department was not good. They had this AI lab that was yes, yes. Uh, somewhere else. Yeah, out at the DC Powers building. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, people really did not support yes. one another. Yeah. Uh, it was, I would not have had a good time there if I was a faculty member there. Mm. So we were speaking earlier with Constable, and Dick Conway was here too, that the fact that we were cohesive and talked to each other, which is what propelled us into being number five. Right. Even though the others had large DARPA grants and machines and were much larger, we were a close-knit faculty. In, in I, a way I, that's hard to do now. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, it's true that we were very cohesive and that helped. But something that Dick may not have said mm -hmm. is I think he moved us into number five because I think he was the one that wrote the chairs of all the departments and asked them to rank the departments. Yes, yes. And he produced this early ranking mm -hmm. where I think we were five. I'm, yes. I'm not sure I have my facts right. But that sort of solidified us. Yes. And he, he may not even remember he did it, but I, I think. He did, he did. Uh, oh, he, it, he remembered it. It, it was a major component in, I think, in, in our being there. So I'm gonna get to your uh, statesmanship in a minute, but first, uh, there are two other areas, the education and your continued research. You continue to do research even after you were chair and then you were a dean for eight years or so, right? right. How do you do that? Well, I do what I love to do, and I, I really enjoy research and, mm -hmm. and, and exploring things. I mean, the two things I really love are research and teaching. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know what I'd do in my life if I gave up <laughs> doing mm -hmm. research. Uh, it's, it's just something I love to do. Mm -hmm. and, and I love to work with students. Uh, so, I mean, most of my research now is done in collaboration with other people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you also seem to do best when working with a few individual students on their research and your research, not this large project kind of thing. Right, right. Uh, and that's, that's that partly because I, I do a little bit more theoretical. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people in systems have to have a different, need that, different yes. nature. And that, that's one of the things about our department. I think it supports a wide range of activities. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're going to be a top department, uh, you can't just support the kind of thing you do, you have to. And that, that's yeah, something where you played a big yeah. role in the, in the department mm -hmm. and very appreciative of what you've mm -hmm. done for us. So uh, what would you say to a young faculty member about teaching? You've obviously an excellent teacher and you're able to write in such a way that makes a big impression on lots of people. Your texts are outstanding. Yeah, what, what, uh, yeah. what advice do you have to give for these younger people? Well, I actually give them slightly different advice. I talk about their career uh, because somebody's job is going to be a big piece of their life. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly anybody who graduates from Cornell is going to earn enough money that they shouldn't let money be a factor in deciding what mm -hmm. they're going to do. Um, so I sometimes point out there's 168 hours in a week and figure out how many you sleep, how many you eat, how many you work, and what's left over is discretionary. Mm -hmm. And it comes out to about 15, one five. Mm -hmm. But if your job is what you really like to do, then it's 55. Mm, it's 55. So I tell them, you know, you really ought to decide what it is you enjoy doing. Because you only get mm -hmm. one life to live and you ought to enjoy, you know, every aspect of it. Uh, and if you know if you enjoy teaching, you're you're going to be a good teacher. If you want, if you really care about the success of your students, I, I think that's the most important thing. It's it's not how much you know, <laughs> or uh, you know how good you are as a lecturer or something like that. It's it's whether you care about the success of your students. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's one of the things I'm very proud of is that I have several of my students who are members of our National Academy. And, mm -hmm. uh, You've had many PhD students. Right. How many? I think about 35. 35? I stopped at 20. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the major advice you have for them is to do what you enjoy doing. That's right. And what you think will make a, an impact. Right. You try to balance those. Right, it, because today, mm -hmm. see, when I was started my career, uh, publishing, there was no pressure to publish. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you probably ought to publish something once, at least once every two years or something. But by the time I was a full professor, I had only 10 publications. Uh, mm -hmm. That would hardly get you a faculty job today. And uh, this is one of the changes, um, is today there is this pressure for number of publications and what conferences and journals they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe a little later we'll come to my work in China. Yes. But this is what is destroying education yeah. in various places. Um, I remember Jerry Salton. Uh, what, what he did whenever we were interviewing a new faculty, he read one of their papers and he knew what was in it. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't let anybody count the number of papers or say, you know, yeah. talk about where they were published. He focused on what were the results in it. Yes. And, and I think that was one of the things. See, we had a unique set of individuals here at Cornell in the early days, you and Jerry and, and Conway and Constable, who were all focused on quality yeah. and, and, and excellence and supported one another. And uh, those are important, and I hope we, hope we don't lose it. Because I do notice in the language now, people say, where has he published? or how many which papers, journal, yes. which journal. Which and conference. they will deny that they're counting or stuff. But when, when the language changes, you sort of sense something has changed. So they, the, the feeling almost is if a paper isn't in a, a top-notch conference, it can't be any good. Right. And there's something wrong with that right. in the way we think. So you became chair of computer science. You did a wonderful job on that. And then you actually told the dean that you would be an assistant dean. Right. right? Tell us why you did that. Well, I could s see that one could, in an administrative position, one could make things happen. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, the dean focused on undergraduate education, which was very important. But he wouldn't say anything about also quality of research. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could change that. Hmm. And so I uh, tried to do that. So my position was associate dean for research. For, you had uh, the, yeah. yeah. And then, then he stepped down a year later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became one of the candidates and yeah. became dean. And that started your, uh, in a sense, your statesmanship work in yeah. talking about the field to others, helping other, helping other departments, helping other countries with their education. Yeah. You want to tell us about some of that work that you've done? Well, the, the thing about other countries is it turns out that other countries know that they have to improve education mm -hmm. if they're going to build mm -hmm. their economies. And they're putting the resources in. Mm -hmm. And once you start working in one country, I think these countries talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, hundreds of countries will ask you to help them. Um, and so I, I've worked in a number of even places like Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, my main focus now is on China because I thought I could do one thing. And that is uh, help China significantly improve university education. Uh, there is no university in China ranked in the top 100. In the top 100? 100, yeah, by if you look at r reasonable yeah, rankings. Yeah. And their Ministry of Education uh, asked if I would work for them in trying to upgrade education. And one of the things they told me, they said, uh, what we need to do is change the culture in our mm -hmm. universities. And I had to ask them, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I sort of now yeah. know. Uh, but initially, what they would do is they'd pick a city where there are a fair number of universities, and they'd invite 25 faculty, and I would go over and teach those faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, but very quickly, I realized it wasn't working. Um, 
one of the things I told them when I took the job is I'd do it if they would put some metrics in for evaluating how well mm -hmm. we were doing. And they thought we were doing successfully well because their metric was how many of these faculty taught a course with the name of the course that I was mm -hmm. helping them develop. And there was 100% success. Of course, yes. <laughs> but, but my metric was how much did these people know afterwards? And I thought out of 25, maybe only two would be qualified mm -hmm. to teach a course. And so I, I told them after three of these courses mm -hmm. that they were wasting their money and we ought to mm -hmm. quit. And at that point, the president of Shanghai Xiaotong University got a hold of me and said a better, this is one of the top five mm -hmm. universities in China. He said a better strategy would be if I would accept a position as counselor to him and help him upgrade mm -hmm. this university. They could produce PhDs who would go out to the next ring of universities and mm -hmm. so on. And it seemed like a reasonable strategy, so I mm -hmm. accepted this position. And I've been working for him for four years and I now realize that the culture is an incredible difficult problem to change. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually, you won't believe this, but their faculty are on three-year contracts. And the mm -hmm. contract says your salary in the next contract is going to depend on how many papers you mm -hmm. publish and how much research money you bring in. Okay, well, mm -hmm. I was able to get that changed on paper, but, but there's been no <laughs> change in reality. Yes. Uh, but I, I'm still working. Hmm. Uh, uh, this September, uh, they are going to start to at least evaluate the teaching of hmm. several hundred faculty. There, there are 3,000 faculty at the institution. And, uh, but we'll, we'll see how it uh, goes. Cornell has, have, has how many faculty? About 1,600. 1,600, Six yeah. yeah. So that's twice our size. Yeah, but they, they also have 30,000 students. Yeah. <laughs> Twice our size. Right. Yes. Hmm. Uh, so, with all this this work, it, it's amazing to me how you have been able to do all this this statesmanship like uh, work, helping other countries, helping your own country, and still keep up your research. Again, well, I guess that's because you're working with a few students. And, right. And. Yeah. But it's also like, um, as you realize, I've brought 35 students from China yes. over here uh, to get have one month to see an American an experience yeah. in an American university, and uh, we couldn't pay Cornell tuition, so I'm teaching them a course and yes. giving them uh, credit over in Shanghai, yes. uh, and what I'm having the students do is research. Yes. And mm. each one has a research project, and so you know I'm mm. working with them, and uh, that's, that you mm. sort of you, you combine your teaching and your research together. Mm -hmm. So it's not that these are really two things you're doing; it's yeah. it's all mm. part of one. So this is the second year that John has had 33 students come from one university. They're all seniors. They will oh, be se they will be year. seniors next year, and the hope is that having been here for a month. Some of them will apply to be our graduate students. And the idea is to try to get the best students to come do this so we have the best ones applying to Cornell. A very innovative idea. The neat thing is that somehow he gets China to pay for all this, for all the students' travel and, and everything. Um, and so he's really trying to help our department in this way increase our, our, the quality of our PhD students. What else would you like to well, say? No, I, I, I think that that pretty much covers it, but I, I guess one thing I would say is um, one of the things is how you behave is going to have a big mm -hmm. impact on your career. Uh, because I tried to figure out really how President Bush got my name. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that when I was at Princeton, uh, there were some older men who worked in some of the research companies around there who wanted to come and talk to faculty. Mm -hmm. And most of the junior faculty had just no time for them. But I was willing to sit down and have a cup of coffee with them and so mm -hmm. forth. And I think one of them told somehow told David Packard about me. Because uh -huh. David Packard contacted me and asked me if I'd be on his science advisory board. And I did this and then I started to interact with him. And I suspect when Bush was elected, he called mm -hmm. Packard just to talk to him. And mm -hmm. Packard said, why don't you put John on the mm -hmm. science board? And so I think it may have been because I was willing to treat people with respect 
And th this was something my father taught me. He, he was a janitor. He was, he was actually an illegal citizen. <laughs> and he worked wow. for half of minimum wage. <laughs> Where did he come from? Uh, he came from England. But mm -hmm. after he had fought in World War I, mm -hmm. and there were no jobs in England afterwards. And so they gave him passage to Canada where they said there'd be jobs, but mm -hmm. there weren't. And he mm -hmm. worked across Canada and then into the United States. And, mm -hmm. um, but he taught me to respect people, even, mm -hmm. even a janitor. Uh, so one of the things I did when I was uh, a department chair uh, is I knew the janitor, we, we would have lunch and the janitors had to clean up afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I thought one day, you know, we ought to provide the janitors, actually it was breakfast we provided them. Uh, and so I did that. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I asked them, I said, is there anything we can do to make your job simpler? Mm -hmm. And one of them said, yes. He said, a lot of people stand with their foot up against a wall and it leaves a mark. Mm -hmm. And we've got to get down on our hands and feet and rub it off. Hmm. And I said, well, let me see if I can take care of that. And I just sent a polite email to people saying, if you see somebody with their foot up against the wall, just mention to them that it leaves a mark and mm -hmm. not to do it. And the janitors really appreciated mm -hmm. that. And what I noticed is a couple weeks later, uh, every Monday they would come in and talk to my administrative assistant. And so I went out to ask, what are they asking you? And she said, each week they want to know what rooms you're going to have important meetings in hmm. so they'll be clean. Hmm. You know, uh, if you treat people with respect, mm -hmm. they will they treat respond, you yes, yes. and it will have a big impact in your career. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and mm -hmm. I, if we were looking to promote someone to an important job, we wouldn't promote anybody who didn't treat people no, well. That's right. And, yes. and I think a lot of people ha are like that. So. Another piece of advice I give yes. students is treat pe everybody with respect. Doesn't matter who so they are. So, in a are. sense, your character is is very important. Is, oh, it's That's it's very important. I think. Yeah. There are some institutions where they say that the end of education is character. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've I've been teaching for what forty years mm -hmm. or fifty That's years. Fifty and years. years. I still don't know what it is <laughs> that I'm really doing. Because I, I know it's not the material, the specific material in the course that I'm teaching, which is, helps them evaluate. Because when, when I was Dean of Engineering, it turned out that 10 of the CEO 500 companies, their CEOs were graduates of engineering. And I, when I went and talked to them, there was, and I would ask them, what was it about Cornell education that helped them be successful? There was nobody who said anything that they learned specifically yes. in a course. It, it's something else. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so hard to evaluate, yep. you know, quality of teaching and quality of education. Yeah. But mm -hmm. these are things you only learn when you're much older. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, John. This yeah. has been yeah. a wonderful time. Oh, thank, it. thank you yes. and, and Bob for uh, setting this yes. up. And it's really appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.